Good morning and welcome to the Federal Laboratory Consortium webinar series. Today's session is titled Accelerating Technology Transfer. The presentation will run approximately 60 minutes. Questions will be accepted and answered throughout the presentation, so please enter your questions in the chat box in your webinar menu, which should be on the right-hand side of your screen, and send questions to staff in drop-down menu. This webinar will be recorded, and the recording will be online within 24 to 48 hours. You will receive an email with information about how to access the recording. Slides will also be available online at this time. For technical questions or issues, please type your issue into the same chat box in the webinar menu for immediate assistance. Our speaker today will be Paul Zielinski. Mr. Zielinski is the Director of the Technology Transfer Partnerships Office at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. He currently serves as the FLC Agency Representative for the Department of Commerce, NIST, and is a candidate in the upcoming election for FLC Chair. Mr. Zielinski has previously worked at the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Energy. In addition, he has served on active duty as a commissioned officer in the U.S. Army. Also joining us to moderate the webinar is Moshe Bahar. Ms. Bahar is the Chief of the Cancer Branch at the Office of Technology Transfer, National Institutes of Health, as well as the current chair of the FLC. Many thanks to both for joining us today. Now I'd like to turn the floor over to Ms. Bahar. Thank you, Michelle. And good morning and welcome to the first of four webinars which um, are taking place in lieu of our national meeting. As you know, uh, the agency's uh, travel budgets have been cut, which um, led to our cancellation of our annual meeting. But because we wanted to make sure we bring to each of the laboratories the training opportunities and the panels that we had planned for our national conference, we will have four of these um, webinars. Um, of which this is the first. Um, I just wanted to frame a little bit today's talk for you. In the past two years, as you know, technology transfer has become a household concept or a household name. We first had the STIPI report, the Science and Technology Policy Institute report, which basically examined the landscape of federal technology transfer and studied the uh, current practices of technology transfer in the federal government, be it in a government-owned, government-operated labs or government-owned, contractor-operated labs. After that came the America Invents Act, which is arguably the most radical change to our patent law system since 1838. And after that came the presidential memo, which is the subject of today's um, talk. Um, Paul Zielinski has a very unique perspective and I think is uniquely suited to bring us this webinar because Mr. Zielinski is not only a seasoned uh, technology transfer professional, but his agency is the host agency for the Federal Laboratory Consortium, as well as um, he, he being the chair of the um, Interagency Working Group of technology, on Technology Transfer, which you'll be hearing about. Uh, during the talk. So without further ado, uh, Paul Zielinski. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Mojda. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, join everyone today, and thank you for everybody who's attending this. Um, very much looking forward to uh, talking to everybody today. Please feel free to ask questions. Mojda is going to moderate the session, and so let's go ahead and kick off. Uh, again, my name is Paul Zielinski. I'm the Director of the Technology Partnerships Office over at NIST. Um, and I've been with the FLC for quite a few years, so uh, very happy to join you. I've actually talked about this, this idea and what we're talking about today over the last couple meetings, actually at the last couple annual meetings, we've had sessions related to this. And so now it's, I'm actually really happy to present to you rather than sort of a forward-looking, you know, what we think is going to happen with this presidential memorandum and what we expect agencies to maybe be doing. I can talk a lot more about what actually happened and what's, what's agencies have actually produced and then what we're actually going to do about that. So this is a lot more concrete than what we've been able to do in the last couple of years. But I should note, probably more than anything, is that you know it's had a significant influence on the process to actually share this information in previous FLC meetings. And so the discussion, the thoughts that went into the FL uh, into this process 
came directly from the FLC meetings and from the participation of the folks who attended those meetings, you know, both at the national level and even at some of the regional meetings as well. So you know, thank you very much for all the folks that have participated this, uh, in this activity in the past. And you know, we really invite you to keep engaged with this whole process. You know, really, none of this stuff happens without people out there. Um, you know, tech transfer, is, uh, as everyone knows, is something that you have to do on the ground. It's important to have people involved. So let's go ahead and get started with some of this. Again, this isn't a new activity. Policy, this policy development activity within the current administration really started quite some number of years ago. But we have went through a couple of different evolutions of different groups and processes. We have this WIP group, the White House Innovation Information Policy Working Group, um, the National Economic Council and the Office of Science and Technology Policy were co-chairs in this group. Uh, so again, very high level types of things coming up with policy issues. Uh, this involved in this innovation and entrepreneurship working group, which again, you know, then subdivided itself into some subcommittees. So really out of this, there was actually quite a bit of activity. So one of the things they tackled was the SBIR process. They looked at this SBIR 2.0. Of course, we've just recently seen the reauthorization of SBIR. And, you know, that contains some significant changes. They tried to tackle the idea of university research. And so they actually came up out of this working group with several proof of concept centers. And those, again, were focused very much on the extramural portion of the federal um, research continuum. Capital's been a big issue. Everybody knows the housing crisis, the tightening capital, less money available from banks. So Startup America came, actually came out of this working group as well. And so again, this is addressing the idea of trying to get capital out there for innovation, trying to get more money from venture firms, and how do we actually make sure that new companies can start up and that actually the capital is flowing, we, don't, we didn't restrict the, uh, the flow of dollars to start new businesses. Probably one of the things that seemed the easiest was this idea of federal lab commercialization, you know, kind of our topic. And so it was really put off until the end. It was actually the last of the four different work groups to kick off. And so then, you know, finally we turned our attention to this federal lab commercialization issue and there was a lot of work that was done on it and there was, uh, you know, a good deal of uh, members of the FLC actually participated in this process. Um, Rick Brenner, who's actually recently retired, but used to do a lot of our um, you know, the town hall meetings. He was actually detailed over to um, work on this thing directly downtown with uh, the different folks over at the White House staff. And we really put a lot of effort into this. So there was a lot of planning that went into, a lot of input that went in. And again, the feedback from some of the FLC meetings directly fed into this process. There's a big debate about, so what's going what's to happen out of this thing? What do we produce? Well, you know, a lot of different ideas floated around. At one point, it was you know, considered maybe it should be an executive order. There was a bunch of different mechanisms that were talked about. But in the end, we had a presidential memorandum. So it was a memorandum that came out from President Obama to the heads of all the agencies and departments. Basically, here's the directions from the boss. This is what we want you to do. It was actually a really nice memorandum in many respects because what it really did is a couple major things. First of all, was really put what we do on the table here, put it in the spotlight. Recognize right up front in terms of policy that the, what we do is important to fueling innovation in the American economy. And so it really recognized the key role that federal laboratories and inventions from federal laboratories play in feeding this whole innovation continuum. The other major thing that it really did, which you really don't see often in a lot of different uh, things that come down is it really avoided the one-size-fits-all mentality. So you see right up front, it addressed the idea that federal laboratories are mission-oriented laboratories. It's not something where you just say, this is going to work and it's going to work for everybody. No, quite a different approach. Basically said, each of the laboratory is working on its mission, and there's different characteristics for those missions. And so you really have to consider each one slightly differently. So let's talk about sort of, so what are the other parts of that? So that was actually section one set up this, you know, this is important, I'm telling you it's important, and it was nice coming right there, like I said, right from the boss, right at the top. So it actually came with a lot of responsibilities though, so there are specific deliverables that came out of this memorandum as well. So specifically to the agencies, as I said, it was recognized that agencies have a particular mission. And so it was required that each agency look at its own mission. What are its individual goals within the agency? And what are the measures of how you're going to measure that success within that, within that agency? And again, this means that they can be different. Each agency could, perform, could propose and actually execute their own performance goals and measures within this framework. So within 180 days, the memorandum, by the way, was signed in October of 2011. So within 180 days, essentially April of 2012, these things were due into OMB, OSTP, and over to uh, Commerce. 
And so then we went through the process of starting to review these things. The, um, the plans were supposed to cover a five-year period. Uh, from 2013 to 2017 was sort of the execution period for these things, and this is the area that we're going to evaluate. And of course, we're in that period now. So you know, this has all been building up. There's a lot of work to be done by the end of uh, last September in order to kick off the new fiscal year, and those things are in place. And so we're actually now in the performance period of this whole process. Uh, the, really, you know, one of the important things is that the agency heads were actually given direction. They were actually encouraged to be part of this process and actually include tech transfer in the overall evaluation of the performance of the laboratory. So it wasn't simply a matter of saying, you know, great tech transfer people, you go out and you do things, we'll see how you do. Rather, it was encouraged that the agencies take a look at what this means to their laboratory functions and then how are they evaluating the performance of the laboratory overall in the area of technology transfer. It's not good enough to just have the work products come out of the lab, but now we want to see how you're transferring out to the economy. Big change in terms of you know, overall direction and you know, again, it's the requirement from the top. So there was also some specific taskings for the interagency work group on tech transfer. I'll talk about that in a slide to come about exactly what that is. Um, very related to what we do here in the FLC. But there were some specific tasks to recommend some opportunities for improving federal tech transfer across the board. So what, are we, what can we do differently? What can we do as new opportunities? And then really taking a look at the metrics. And so these two things are a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Along the way, we also talked about some other things. So SBIR was a big pro part of this process um, in Section 3. We wanted to see streamlining. So we talked about streamlining the SBIR process. But it was also recognized that you know, businesses need to lower the bar to get in. And so the red tape, everybody knows where the government, we got a lot of requirements, paperwork's always an issue. And so what can we do in order to basically make this process easier with our, uh, for our partners, make it easier for our partners to engage with us? How do we meet them on the halfway, meet them more than halfway, and try to get them on board? And so we were really directed specifically to try to streamline our operations, particularly licensing, CRADAs, uh, as I said, SBIR. And then there's this other thing in here about uh, everyone knows, prior to actually very, very recently, you know, if you just look at even as recently as last year, there was no one-stop shop to find out what federal inv inventions were out there on the marketplace, shy of the PTO. You could actually do a search and look for assignments to the federal government. Probably not the most intuitive way for people to figure out what's available from federal laboratories, but we actually had a patchwork of each agency having some systems that basically told you what patents were available for licensing. Some very good tools. Unfortunately, it also required quite a lot of work to be engaged with each and every agency rather than coming to a one place. So we'll talk about how that was done a little bit as well. And then, of course, as I mentioned, and I'll continue to mention, mention throughout this presentation, is this really important focus on local and regional partnerships. And as I said, I can't emphasize enough, it's, in, it's not just what we do in the federal government, but how do we reach out to other people? You know, it happens on the ground. Regions have different characters, and we need to make sure we're reaching out and working with the state governments, the state organizations, economic development organizations, regional initiatives, um, very much the local initiatives. Obviously, the uh, FLC has a state and local government committee that actually focuses on this area as well. So, you know, it's one of those things that we recognize is incredibly important. And it, so it was specifically called out in this memorandum as something that we need to make sure that we're paying attention to and something that we strengthen in the process. Okay, so I mentioned this interagency work group on technology transfer. So what is it? Well, originally, if you look back in Executive Order uh, 12591, uh, you see the establishment of a work group for uh, on technology transfer. So you look at this executive orders back from the 80s, the late 80s, and eventually, uh, originally this was actually one of these high-level work groups with secretarial-level folks, and then there was a supporting group that kind of basically made it happen, the implementation team that actually made this thing happen. Well, work groups, as with you know what they are, they essentially they burn out relatively quickly. Quickly, they have a fairly short lifespan of about a year. They're usually a task force to get something done and you know get it done, put policies in place, and then kind of dissolve. Uh, this one remained actually the group that supported it, which was made up of the policy, basically the tech transfer leads from all of the different agencies, and then also supported by their general counsel's office stayed together, actually. So this group has been around since the late 80s and deals with policy functions. It also continues to function under, I gave you the legal citation here, the uh, US code, but essentially what this says is that uh, 
a lot of the responsibilities within tech transfer are written into the commerce sections of the um, U.S. Code. And so it gives some specific functions to the Secretary of Commerce in terms of coordinating with the other agencies. And so this is where the coordination with the other agencies, if you will, in the way that's written, this is where it takes place in terms of policy, uh, regulation, and guidance. And so the regulatory, when you look at, for example, within the CFR, there's some regulations regarding tech transfer. Those actually fall under commerce. And anything we would do in terms of coordinating with agencies would happen both through this interagency work group and also through FLC. Uh, as I said, the members of there's a lot of overlap between the FLC and this interagency work group because most of the agency representatives to the FLC are in fact some of the same folks in the interagency work group. Um, as Mojda mentioned, I basically convene this thing. I hate to call myself the chair because I think I'm more of a convening person than a, than a participant uh, in the work group. I don't, you know, it's kind of one of these things uh, where we kind of share the load very much equally and discuss things across offices and really talk about policy level issues. And so that's why this group was actually tapped within the presidential memo to kind of look at what are the policy issues here. So we divided up into a couple different subgroups. Uh, opportunities, of course, you know, this follows very directly with the requirements and the mandate that were put forth in the presidential memorandum. So opportunities and regional partnerships, basically, you know, if you look at the opportunities, a lot of those are regional partnerships as well. We actually had two work groups. They kind of melded together by the end. Uh, we formed a team that looked at communication. Now, when you look at communication, this wasn't just about messaging, but it was much more on that particular section of the, uh, in section three, talking about this idea of bringing the databases together and how do we communicate what's available from federal laboratories. Um, I should mention that the opportunities group was led by uh, Rick Brenner, the regional partnerships by Karina Edmonds over at DOE, actually Rick Brenner from USDA Communications, um, by, Al, uh, by uh, Ken Levine over at VA. Uh, metrics, that was actually mine because we were specifically tasked for my organization to lead a metrics piece. Um, so we had a metrics work group. We also had a work group working on the American Vents Act. So as Mojda mentioned, you know, this didn't happen in a vacuum. Everything else moving forward at the same time. Uh, American Vents Act passed and we also had a group then looking at, so how does this integrate with this, uh, with this major change in the patent process? And actually we had people from PTO participating as a lead in the American Vents Act work group. Okay, so going back to what we we're supposed to do, agency plan. So the first thing we want to do is make sure that the agencies were focusing on technology transfer, what that means within their agency. Was, as I said, nothing beats direction from the top saying to the uh, political appointees all the way down the line, this is important, this is something I want, I'm want. i saying is important for the president and that I want you to focus on. And so there was a lot of emphasis played on this uh, whole thing. We had to produce plans, so we had 13 different agency plans that were submitted. Um, you know, again, these all had to go through the review and clearance chain all the way to the top so that they could be submitted over to OMB and OSTP over at the White House. Uh, they do include the focus on the, age, you know, the, sort of the general stuff. And I say generally, you know, some of these basic things are in every plan. The reason I use the word generally here is because there's a lot more in some of the plans. So some of them are much more inclusive of other areas. Uh, but we do all have a focus on what does it mean in terms of what is the agency planning to do? What innovations are they bringing into the process? What new ideas can, are they proposing for the agency to do? How is the agency going to measure those different goals? You know, what are their goals and how are they going to measure success? What do they define success as within the agency? And again, it's very different. So for example, if you're in DOD, you got to consider that they want to basically serve the warfighter. So there's a difference in how you bring technologies back in versus something like my agency uh, at NIST where we're basically looking at how we move things out to the uh, measurement community, metrology. So again, very different goals, and so therefore very different ways to measure it, and those were all put forward in these plans. Um, we talked about the streamlining of operations, so streamlining creatives and licensing obviously was called for, so that's addressed. SBIR and STTR are actually addressed in many of the plans, even though I'm not going to get into that so much here, because that sort of takes on a life of its own there, and there's a whole different work group that's dealing with those issues. But at the same time, they were addressed in these plans, and you can find out about that um, process. Although I will say there was quite a bit about how you link up the two, because we do, all bo we do both focus on small businesses within the tech transfer world as well as in the SBIR world. And so they do really come together. And again, this idea of we don't do it alone. We need local and regional partners. And how do we do outreach to the people on the ground who are making this happen? And how do, you know, how do we get this place-based idea in there for technology transfer? Um, so, again, the plans were never meant to be secret. They're very public. 
Um, so agencies were asked to publish them on their website, and many of them did. Uh, we also produced a website um, from NIST basically just as a one-stop shop, and you can find all the agency responses. And so there's a link here included. And again, these slides will be published later, so you can either write this down, which is kind of a long thing, or you can wait till the slides get published. Honestly, if you just Google on um, you know, NIST publications, uh, presidential memo, you pretty much get right to this place anyways or something to those combinations. But it's very easy to find, and actually, so you can find the link to each and every one of these plans at this website. As I said, there were some specific agency requirements, and then there were some interagency requirements. So they're all on the same website. Here you have the same thing again. Um, we wanted to make sure all these things were available to everyone. Now, if you look at the stack of these things, it's probably about a foot thick if you print them all off. Um, I know uh, he's part of the review process for these things, and, and it's a lot of reading. So even though it wasn't specifically asked for, we did want to produce an executive summary, and so we did that. There's an executive summary document, and so what it does is it basically takes this look across all of the um, agency plans by agency and says, you know, here's the goals and the approach that are taken by the different agencies. It kind of gives you the short version of that. So that's sort of dividing it up. Know, one way, and then we want to do the cross cut and look at it the other way, and this is the answer to one of the things we're specifically tasked to do. And that's to say, so okay, so what are the opportunities that are presented? And so what we did is sort of turned it the other way. Instead of starting with the agency, we started by the different areas of technology transfer and then talked about underneath that what are the different examples of things the agencies are doing as new approaches. And of course, the idea here is that if one agency basically propose something, we're all going to pay attention to that. You know, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. We talk about it in forums like the FLC. We talk about it in the interagency work group. We compare it in a lot of different areas. We want to see how everyone's doing, and things that work are going to float to the top, and those things you'll start seeing proliferating across all of the different agencies. And so we, you know, it's also a good thing for folks out there to ask other agencies, hey, I see these guys are doing it. Can you do something like that? Can't always do it. Depends on statutory authority. But you know, it's worth a shot. You know, I should say there's a couple things we tried to ask for along the way. So one of those specifically was um, we were trying to see if we could get sort of that, if one agency can do it, can we all do it? So something like a Space Act agreement, which is specific to NASA, could we all take advantage of that? Well, we didn't get that authority, but we tried. And so that was, so this was, you know, a, real, a good opportunity to ask for things. And so we were trying to take advantage of that as well. Uh, the other thing we did is, and there's a separate document for this, um, I'll go into it in a bit of detail here um, coming up as well, and that's talking about government metrics. And so we've got some things that were set out by statute. We all knew they weren't all that great. Um, I mean, they do tell a story, but we wanted to give a little bit more information. And so we did set out metrics, and that, again, is also at the same website, sort of a summary document on uh, how we're changing that whole process within the government. Okay, so let's go into some of these different areas. So one of the first things, this opportunities document. So what new technologies are available? What are the new technology transfer places? So all these, so the opportunities as well as the metrics follows the same sort of construct, if you will. So of course, new technology scientific work products is the name we gave this. It's basically what are the things that we produce? What's coming out of our laboratory? We got this huge investment. We got $140 billion roughly in federal research every year. About a third of that roughly, probably a little bit more at this point, the last, docu the last uh, table I've seen on it, um, is intramural research, the stuff we're working on with the Federal Laboratory Consortium, the things that are addressed by this presidential memorandum. So you're really talking about a lot of money, close to about $50 billion annually in research and development. And this is where we're talking about how that research and development is reaching the public, or at least some of the ways we're transferring this to the public. So it's a big investment. We want to communicate what we're doing. At the same time, the mission isn't just to communicate how well we're doing, but it's actually to make a difference. And so we want to make sure we're expanding economic development and sort of pushing this concept of, well, so what are we doing? Well, you know, we always talk about patents and licensing within the construct of the FLC for tech transfer, but the fact of the matter is we do lots of other work that is not patented that we convey to the public that makes a difference in the economic uh, development of the country. In fact, probably far more knowledge goes across not patented, but actually in other in free mechanisms, essentially papers and those types of things. And so that knowledge transfer is something we wanted to recognize and we wanted to capture as well. 
Then you got this whole new other area. You know, we've got new trends. You know, all the tech transfer legislation is written back in the 1980s. But you know, or, well, at least it started back then. There's been some modification, but you know, we haven't caught up. We've got open source models. You know, the whole wiki approach to things. Uh, but you know, you even look at something like Wikipedia, and there is a copyright. But we haven't caught up with those types of things. So we don't copyright work products within government, uh, with with very few exceptions. And so we haven't really caught up to that model. We're not really exactly sure how to catch up with some of those things. But we did want to take a look at what are the new new models for tech transfer. And then how do we get new approaches and new tools in place in order to deal with those? So improving outreach. Uh, can't say it enough, it's not a matter of just putting out the information, but it's actually a matter of going out there and working with people, that whole contact sport idea of technology transfer. So we talked about doing trade meetings and social media. You know, a lot of this stuff was pioneered within the FLC. The Mid-Atlantic uh, region had a big push on this in terms of sort of that place-based technologies with the people at the right place and delivering a cross-agency view of what's going on in an area to try and make it easier on our, on our partners and potential partners. A lot of discussion about using you know, internet, social media, growing trend, uh, all of these different tools. And how do we make use of those in technology transfer? Good bit on social media. It's actually interesting just seeing sort of bringing ourselves up into the modern world. Uh, the use of intermediaries, you know, we've got different partnership intermediary agreements, both in a formal way, particularly within DOD, USDA recently grew their whole process. Um, but, you know, we're not really even talking about, uh, for example, the uh, manufacturing extension program within NIST serves in, in a lot of ways a similar function to some of the intermediaries. But, it's, in fact, what we started looking at, what you see in these plans, isn't necessarily just the idea of single, you know, intermediaries focusing on one agency, but even how do we partner, have inter intermediary partnerships, basically cross-agency intermediaries, and how do we start expanding that network to really grow this thing and work on technology transfer across the government and uh, interagency work. Uh, Place-based, can't say it enough, working out there with the folks on the ground, it's really a particular thing. And so we talked about then, how do we go out and work in different geographic areas, Really look at the local infrastructure, what's the candidates that are out there, you know, where are the employees based. And that makes a big difference in what areas we focus on, what technologies in different areas. But also then trying to look at, for example, you always call them the flyover states. You know, we've got a lot of tech development that happens on the coast, but out there in the center of the country, we don't want to forget them either. So how do you grow technology in areas that are interested in building their local infrastructure, not just areas that have it already, but actually trying to grow it in areas that are interested. So it's a matter of reaching out, talking to the people on the ground, how do you work with those local folks out there in regional technology development organizations and see what they're interested in, and where there's the support and the push? Okay, another big area, licensing and center programs. Um, a couple of these have been floated, but we kind of captured them into these plans and talked about them. And again, we'll continue to talk about it. what's been the success. So, you know, NIH had some specific outreach mechanisms for small businesses. Um, Energy produced the Next Energy Innovator Program, where they were looking at different mechanisms to bundle and make easier terms for small businesses. I know NIST itself, we produced some other things, some, some ideas, you know, basically riding a little bit on the coattails of those before us. You know, what are other people doing? Let's propose some, uh, some new potential technology um, licensing terms, put them out front, let people see that we are friendly to work with. Obviously, and a lot of this has always been negotiable. But it's a matter of communication in a lot of these things and focusing on our small business partners. So although, yes, we welcome large businesses as well as small businesses, again, the outreach is towards these people that maybe are a little more difficult to reach or have a lot less uh, infrastructure in order to be able to kind of get over that threshold, get themselves started. And so that's why the focus is there. I think the larger partners have a pretty good idea how to work with federal labs. So that's not exactly where we put the, the emphasis in these plans. Not to mention, I think, you know, we've also had a long-standing uh, preferences for small business, both in uh, licensing as well as in our CRADAs. And so we wanted to make sure we recognize that in these types of programs. You know, another area, and this one's still growing, is this idea of complementary technology. So we know that NIH works on medical devices. You know, we expect that energy is working on things like energy sources. But you know, there's a lot of, but you got to look at these things across the board. And so when you look at something like energy feedstocks, of course, you know, you've got USDA producing 
feedstocks that are going to feed into an energy which might be used by defense or even developed somewhere in defense as a new feedstock, or something like EPA, and then looking at emissions that come out of these types of things and what's the impact on the environment. So these things don't happen in a, in a closed system. They, hope, they happen as a life cycle. And so we wanted to try to look across agencies as sort of this complementary technologies. And so how do you put together you know, maybe a technology isn't so wonderful on its own, and maybe it has a difficult time impacting the market on its own, but how do you bring more technologies to sort of build up the rest of that sort of package deal in order to make it much more palatable, much more uh, uh, usable in the economic picture and something that we can actually get in there? Because, you know, again, that sort of valley of death, how do you get across that? So one of the, you know, this area of complementary technology, I expect to grow some more. We've got a lot more discussions to do in that area. But again, it's nice to see that it's growing. So OK, so scientific technical work products is one big area. The other thing that we do, obviously, is collaborate. So collaborations is the other one, public-private partnerships. You know, we don't do it on our own. We know that many of our inventions are only possible because we work with partners. And this whole idea of having industry drive what we're working on or actually partner with us in order to make sort of what's going on in that lab become something that can be used and sold in the economy. So this is a, obviously a huge area for the FLC, this whole idea of partnerships. Um, you know, but we want to, it's, it's more than just doing creatives. And that's some of what we also wanted to recognize. And see, you see a lot in here about direct transfer of knowledge ideas. I know some of the things we recognize are things like postdoc programs and training programs. We're actually looking at the people that we bring in and train and then send out into industry. And they bring with them those ideas that they learned at the laboratories they bring with them that idea of you know, who is their mentor in the laboratory, but also how do they come back and work with the national laboratories. So they can go out to a company and say, you know, I know how you can get back with these guys. Let's get engaged with them and, how, and, and work with the laboratories in order to produce a product. If they come up with something that's a difficult area, you know, a problem within with their product, they know where to call back and work with us. And so we want to basically look at those things. How do we, base, how do we support that from hap happening? The idea of like entrepreneur and residence, those types of ideas. I mean, these are some key areas where we can actually do more than just transfer only our patented and technologies through a license agreement, but how we can diffuse knowledge through a lot of different mechanisms by working with people. One of the areas actually, and this is kind of an interesting one, software is interesting because it, it happens in a couple of different places. It's obviously a new technology, but it's also an area where we do a lot of partnerships. Causes the problem, as I said, we can't copyright things. And so what tends to happen is we have no idea across the board how many things we produce. Um, a good case study in many of this stuff actually happens to be the Department of Energy because they have these government-owned contractor-operated laboratories. They're under a little bit different system in terms of what they can do in terms of copyright and license for software. Uh, most titles from a government-owned, government-operated laboratory fall under this copyright prohibition. For, uh, for government works, and so basically they go out there. It's a little bit of the Wild West. They go out there on websites and produce these things. Uh, we do see some things talked about in terms of some of the plans specifically of how they're going to work with other companies in order to uh, let companies work with them on software and potentially you know, either copyright, patent, whatever you have it with software. And of course, we could patent some things, but you know, by the time you produce a patent, often software kind of moves a bit faster. That marketplace doesn't move that way. Um, so we do, so there's some interesting proposals in there about expanding how we work with people through CRADAs in order to produce software, um, but this is a whole issue. I think that's one of those areas, and we'll talk about it more in the metrics again, it comes up, where we're going to have to keep exploring what we can do there and maybe look at some new tools, maybe some request some new authorities. Uh, again, as I just said, so this idea of new authorities, well, okay, so the this, the part of the presidential memorandum told us, well, what can you do better if we gave you some different authorities? So I said some of it we talked about in the process of actually developing the memorandum, and some of those things specifically didn't make it in the memorandum, uh, even though they were in earlier versions of it. Some of the things were kind of like this whole idea of tech transfer being an unfunded mandate. Some of the early drafts actually had it, and then there were kind of like this percentage for tech transfers to make sure it was a funded thing. Well, that, that fell out. That didn't survive the process. And you really didn't see those things come up again. I, as I said, the idea of how we approach things like copyright was discussed, but again, it didn't make it didn't make the cut. Um, so you don't see a lot of those things in there because they were addressed early on, but some things did. And so some of the things like enhanced use lease authority, where actually we have excess federal land, um, 
and so different agencies, USDA has actually been using this to, um, in order to bring in partners to use some of their equipment. DOE proposed expanding that, and so basically when this is one of those ideas of how do we get partners in the gate, actually have them work on, use some of the excess uh, land we have on the site and uh, form a partnership, get, get them to work with us. We see different agreement types actually cropping up within these plans. I mentioned a couple times even within the collaboration, but again, there's different types, uh, new MTA type agreements, new creative agreements. NASA proposed some different, some streamlining of the process by doing some actually some different types of credit agreements. Uh, NAH has a thing about a sabbatical program. You know, it doesn't exist, but again, they asked, what can you do? And so these are the types of things that actually address these issues of what can you do. Um, you know, one of the issues we always have with the federal labs is it's very difficult to um, get through the different ethics and other hurdles to have to launch a new company. You know, once you start launching a new company, you pretty much got to shut down your research program and not work on that anymore from the government. So how do you address that? What kind of things can you do? And that's some of those ideas that are starting to get kicked around in these plans. Paul, maybe, uh, Paul it might be um, maybe worth mentioning that actually in the context of the uh, memorandum, the agencies, as you mentioned, were invited to come up with new and innovative, if you will, a wish list. Do you think that agencies took advantage of that to its fullest when they submitted their agency plans? Well, I can tell you, my own opinion is probably not. Um, and again, I think some of that is, you know, again, these things get vetted through a lot of different layers before you go there. And so that tends to have a little bit of an effect on what ends up coming out the other end. Um, you know, I think there's a lot more that we can do, and I think that's actually a really important point in this whole process, and I do mention this actually by the time we get to the end, is that this isn't meant to be a one-shot deal. I mean, we produce these things, but it's not the last bite we have at the apple, if you will, just keep going on the cliches here. But we can continue to propose new things. And in fact, if you look at the basic if the legislation, we've always had an open invitation to propose new metrics and new mechanisms. And so this actually tells us to take advantage of it, I think you see the beginning of it, but I hope that that actually picks up and we see more. Okay, let's go ahead and push ahead. So the other big area that we talked about is efficiency. So again, red tape, we all know it's the government, you gotta do paperwork. But you know, that's one of the most common things we hear is complaints about, it just really is too hard to work with the government. And so that's, and it takes too long to work with the government. And so we wanted to talk about, well, what can we do? How do we streamline operations? And that was one of the things each of the plans actually addresses. How do we make things easier? How do we bring people in? How do we lower that, you know, opportunity cost for business to get started? So that's why you see simplified model agreements and new agreement types. Well, we talked a lot, though, about, mile, about processes. And so you do see things in there about efficiency milestones. How do you reduce the time? How do you increase the automation of the process? How do you standardize things? Again, you don't see what you don't see is you know we're going to have a one-size-fits-all creative that meets everybody's needs. Uh, it's one of those things you hear a lot, and I, you know I think most of the people who've been around tech trans for a while have heard this request before as well. Every agency has a different thing. Well, we all have a base idea for creative, but believe me, even within our own standard creative for the uh, that we have for my agency, and I'm sure everybody has this experience. One size doesn't fit all there, much less across every agency. So it's one of those things, by simplifying, it almost makes it more difficult because then you end up getting into a legal back and forth about what terms you include and which ones you don't. So it's not always as simple as coming up with a standard language that everyone will accept it. Um, it, it just never seems to work that way in practice. At least that's what my experience tells me, but you know that's open to debate, I suppose. Um, the other big area you see in here is training. And training is really a, a very important key. It might seem almost like, well, okay, of course we do training. But you know, the people that come into contact, with, you know, there's only a limited amount of folks in the tech transfer offices. There's a lot of scientists that go out there to these meetings. And they're talking about people who are interested in that topic area. And so the first federal employee, the first person in the laboratory that most people will encounter is probably going to be one of our scientists, not one of our tech transfer office folks. And so it's important that they know that we're open for business. And it's important to know that we have all these tools in the toolbox and methods and ways for them to collaborate. And so one of the things is to make sure that they know that they're trained and they realize the breadth and the abilities that they have in order to collaborate and move technologies out into the marketplace. And so that's actually one of the things that comes up time and again in these plans, is making sure that people are informed. 
I mentioned SBIR. I'm not going to focus a lot on SBIR, but some, one, of the couple, one of the interesting things you see in a lot of the plans is this consideration of where do we leverage the SBIR focus on small business with the tech transfer focus on small business. Um, so again, you see some of these things, the pilot program in order, one of the, the ability of the SBIR program to actually, um, one, of the, one of the areas that uh, is actually in the legislation for uh, SBIR is actually to is focus on tech transfer. And so one of the people from NIST actually, uh, Clara Asmail from NIST actually um, piloted this program back a few years ago about using some of our technologies as subtopics. And so other agencies are also looking at that and see a discussion there about how do you align tech transfer with SBIR. Uh, and again, you also see quite a bit about streamlining the SBIR process within these agency plans. Again, but there's other things that are going on in the SBIR world, and that's a whole other life of its own. So uh, I know some of them, there, there's different linkages between the offices within the different agencies as well. Okay, so in terms of these opportunities, as I mentioned, this idea of the communications work group was looking at this. But this, uh, there was a big focus on where do I go, one-stop shop. We're not really looking for a single solution, however. Uh, you know, really, there's a lot of different proposals that came up in this year. There are numerous, as you all know, there's numerous places that have search engines that look across technologies. Uh, universities have them. Private sector has them. Well, really, so, you know, we were trying to look at it as, well, let's not try to pick this is going to be where we put everything in terms of information. But how do we feed information to everybody? We still needed to produce a website. Well, the, you know, as it works out, the FLC actually did a great job producing its own website. And so they did already, you know, concurrent to this, the FLC took an action and has, uh, had developed this website, the FLC Available Technology Sites. And here's the URL for this site. If you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend it. It's built on a Google platform, so it's a very simple search. Uh, and basically it limps all of the different technology databases across all of the agencies that have these things. At least that's what we're promoting. Uh, every agency isn't in there yet. Again, everybody doesn't necessarily have a database, and so it, you know it's kind of one of those, you got to have that thing to feed into this thing. So we've got to work perhaps on some of these orphans. But by and large, I think the vast majority of federal technologies is now available on this one-stop shop. It's a simple search. It's a real nice tool if you haven't looked at it. Again, can't say enough about it. Check it out. Um, good tool. And what it does is it actually doesn't just take you to information on the FLC site, but it actually transports you over to the agency's website. So you can get information directly from the agency. That's one of the things that I think is really, really nice about it. Uh, and so again, if you haven't participated, I'll do the quick soft sell because I think most people really have. Um, so we've, uh, but you know, please do cooperate with this. This is sort of what we're looking at. One of the big focuses that we have um, across the board is to focus our attention on this website as sort of the one-stop shop, even though we do recognize that we want to feed things out to others. So, you know, do we do a feed out in data.gov? You know, we'd be happy to do that. We've looked at ways to do that. One of the preliminary things actually did that. So we're still developing. It's still evolving in this area. And uh, there's no intent to kind of hoard the data. We really, you know, the best thing for us is to get the information out there. So that's what we're trying to do. You know, along the same lines, um, the FLC developed a real nice tool that we're still building. And again, you know, looking for agency participation out there. But this idea of a small business resource tool. So you see another, agent, another uh, URL there for a different piece of the uh, FLC's website looking at what are the tools that are available to small businesses. So beyond just the patented stuff, what do we have out there that small businesses can take advantage of? Uh, we're trying to build this nice quick one-stop shop. Here's all the different opportunities and different things that you can do out there as a small business to work with the federal government. Okay, big shift here. We're going to talk about metrics. So in addition to opportunities, we also want to talk about changing the sort of how do we measure things in the federal government? How do we measure our success? You know, metrics cost money. Everything you do costs a lot of money. Uh, data is nice, and the more data you have, you know, it's really nice to be able to look at all this stuff. But it all costs money to develop, and it costs money to store, and it costs money to sort. So we wanted to be as responsive as we could, but at the same time recognizing that there's not a lot of new money. Well, there's no new money out there, and there's, you know, everything we do, everything we ask for is going to come with a price tag. Of course, one of the easiest things to do is look at what the agency's already proposed. I mean, each agency produced a plan. They said what was important to them. Uh, a lot of agencies already collect data that's beyond what we collect in the national plans anyways. So we want to look, so what does everybody say is important in their own plans? So what does everybody already 
trying to collect because they think is important. Uh, we didn't do this in a vacuum. We wanted to make sure that we're feeding not only this process, but other processes. So uh, there is a White House initiative, a cross-agency priority goals, um, CAP goals, and you can actually you know, Google those and find those as well. But there's a number of White House initiatives, and one of them specific to uh, small business and innovation actually is uh, our metrics actually feed into this White House metric now. So there's a nice um, syncing of all these different activities there as well. Um, big lab to market push, actually, they've been doing a lot of things actually there as well um, from the White House level looking at how they support this activity. Uh, we were specifically directed to talk to the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics. That's over at NSF. They collect a ton of data already. If you haven't looked at their Science and Engineering Indicators book, great book, tons of information. Agencies invest quite a bit in already putting information in there. We have not really taken advantage of that. And so this is something that we started talking to them about. What is it that we should be looking at? What information is already there rather than charting over again and you know asking for more stuff and have, you know, the basic response is, I already told you that. I'm only reporting that information. And again, we've always had this authority. It's just very difficult to get everyone to commit to uh, reporting new metrics. And so this presidential memorandum really gave that shove to say, you know, let's really take a look at this and revise the whole process. So I think it's kind of a kick that was needed. Uh, but again, Congress has given this authority, and it's been out there for some time now. I keep talking about metrics and what we already collect because we do. Uh, here's a nice citation. But we have all these lovely output metrics. And these things actually go back quite a ways. I guess it was 2000. Um, there was requested annually an agency report on technology transfer. And these are the items that are, that are required by statute. So this idea of, so what are you doing in tech transfer? What's your agency's program? And then a lot of these output metrics. Uh, about you know, number of patents. Um, licenses, there's a lot of really gory detail about the licenses, honestly, that um, I, don't, I don't know how useful some of that is, but you know, it's, it's in there in the statute, so we report it. Uh, we do report on the creatives that we do. There is a piece, uh, again, another lovely citation if you want to look up these things. But uh, the idea is that each agency is supposed to track their creatives as well, and so we do report on the creatives annually also. But again, it's very much output oriented, and if you look at the current documents, you get this sort of huge, okay, we did stuff. So we did 1,500 patents roughly a year. Okay, that's great. It shows a level of activity. It shows that we're very busy. It doesn't necessarily show what we're doing. So we wanted to change that. And it certainly doesn't show the outcomes. The only thing we had on outcomes is actually a, uh, some anecdotes. So what we do actually, okay, so every agency has, is required to produce an annual report. These things essentially all come in, and, and here in my office, we actually at NIST produce then an interagency report. Uh, again, lovely citation here, but it's basically taking the information from the annual reports and then talking about best practices in tech transfer. And so we produce this. And actually, the URLs for these are very similar to the one I produced earlier. And I'll, and I'll give you, again, by the end, I'll, I'll show you where these things are uh, again as well. So these are the current things that we do. And again, they don't tell you a lot other than we're really very busy in tech transfer. In most cases, they show a slight increase in activity, and they show that we're, um, you know, the process is mature, and so it, it's not huge swings in terms of what we're doing in creative patents and licensing. So, okay, so we wanted to change it. So basically, you know, in most of these things, when you're doing program planning, you follow sort of a logic model, and usually the logic model sort of follow, you know, what are the resources? What are you dedicating to the process? What are the outcomes of that process, which we're very good at reporting on? And then what are the outcomes of that process? And then what are the impacts? And so we wanted to sort of walk through a little bit of this. So where do we want to start? Context. You know, we've always talked about how many we produce. But we never really said in the reports themselves how much money is involved in this. And so we're going to include some of this. Again, we have this table that's produced by NSF every year. Um, there's a URL if you ever want to see it. Um, this is actually, interestingly enough, for those of you who don't know it, the money that goes in to support the FLC, I actually get the figures off of this table um, in terms of what, uh, you know, wh where the money is at and from what agency. But we're going to start reporting on it basically to show people, you know, there's a reason why some agencies are bigger than others in terms of uh, the number of patents or creatives or licenses they produce. And some of that is based on funding. Not always, but some idea of context of how much this is worth. Again, we've never actually reported that, believe it or not. 
going back to the same construct, new technology and scientific work product. We know we're going to keep all those output things. Um, but we also are going to, there's some, some new information we want to look at. So again, small business. There's a preference for small business in all of our statutes. What we want to do is actually talk about then, so we've never, again, we've never reported this before, but what is the percentage that goes to small businesses versus large business? How are we doing in terms of bringing new small businesses into this process? So we're going to break that number out. Again, when you look at what costs money, this one costs money. This is something new that agencies will have to collect and report. The other thing that we don't have a different thing on is this number, this idea of startups. Again, you'd think this was obvious. There's a lot of anecdotal information out there on startups. Um, and we're still asking for those anecdotes to continue on startups. But we do want to actually know what new companies are out there that have been developed based on the technology that we're putting out from the federal laboratories. And not just patent and license. And so it doesn't require that you licensed it and therefore it was a startup. We're trying to look broadly at technology transfer. What is it that's coming out of the federal labs that's kicking off these new businesses? Okay, we have this funny construct. What's a small? What's a new startup? Well, okay. Well, we said something within the last five years that's looking at commercializing one of our products. Why that? Well, the problem is you get a company that might be a new company. Maybe they're floundering and just starting out, or maybe they're just trying to figure out what to do. They may have preceded the thing, but pretty much they might be getting built up on a new technology. The idea here is we're not trying to throw out all these really new companies that are growing by saying you know they must be absolutely brand new right out of the box. Um, we're trying to kind of make it a little bit broader so that we capture this idea of companies that are new and growing. And so what are the, you know, the small businesses that are growing businesses? Um, it was recommended, it's interesting, there's been a lot of, there was a lot of pressure to do things about tracking progress. It's kind of like, you know, the, hit them with the tracking tagger and see how they do in a few years. Uh, that's, it, it's something that we, we talked a good bit about. Um, at the moment, we didn't propose doing anything specific in terms of reporting on you know, business growth, new job development. Some of these things seem rather obvious, but you know, again, it's very, very difficult to get that information. So we didn't collect it right now on a sort of this company by company, let's you know, aggregate it and see what the number looks like at approach. I'll talk a little bit later on what we ended up settling on for this. It's not to say that it's off the table. Um, there are things out there like star metrics where they're collecting huge amounts of bibliographic information or, or you know, basically computer-generated information, database-based information, where we can pull information from across a lot of the different sources and get this type of information. We're kind of focusing on how we would harness that whole effort rather than a huge data collection effort that's going to be very costly and require a lot of different uh, inputs from agencies that are funded already. So again, it's not off the table, but we kind of punted that one down the road in terms of collecting specific information on jobs and company growth. Uh, Paul, it's interesting that that's one of the one of the things that has been tabled because that seems to be, as you know, one of the questions that we all get from the head. Yes. What is the economic impact? And although we all agree that so far it seems that most of us measure output rather than impact. Right. Uh, and because of this measurement and a lot of the data that's going to be collected, even under the new suggested metrics, is still about you know two steps away from and this deal created this many jobs, or and this deal created this company. So um, do you, s I mean, I understand that you said it's not off the table and we can, you know, maybe revisit it, but is there a reason that of all things, what the Hill, the legislature is most concerned about is the one that got um, kind of put on the back burner? Well, that's a great question. And the uh, probably the best way I can put it is, is, be, is First of all, there's actually a couple of reasons. First of all is no matter what number we produce at this point, we don't have a very good handle on all the data. And so when we produce a number, we wouldn't be very credible. And that was my, one of my biggest fears is coming up with a number that basically everybody could use as a, as a punching bag um, because it wouldn't be necessarily very accurate and we would have no way to know that it was. Uh, the second is it's, again, very costly. Um, we have a paperwork reduction. You know, there's the Paperwork Reduction Act requirements specifically because it's not only costly to us, but it's costly to our partners. And so we don't want to scare people away and say, yes, you can come in and we do track our licensees, but basically to say to any new company, it's great that you're working on this federal comp this uh, federal invention, but oh, by the way, would you mind giving us a ton of information? And oh, by the way, it's also on your company growth. How you doing? What's your financials? Are you doing well? You, doing, you know, it's a lot of the kind of information that frankly, if you're a really successful company, you're not really looking to give the government credit. Yes, we'd like to take it, 
but that's not really what you're looking to do. So it, it becomes a very spotty collection process, which becomes very expensive with potentially like interviews and, you know, forms and very intrusive. And so for the moment, we kind of backed off knowing that we had to have this whole thing in place by 2013. Um, so what are we doing for impact analysis? I'll come to that in a little bit later slide. I'll t I will talk about what we ended up doing instead. Thank you. Okay, so what else are we talking about? So scientific and technology, so uh, this, this idea of work products. Um, you know, it's great that we produce lots and lots of patents. That's wonderful information. The only problem is it doesn't tell you anything about what we're doing. And so one of the things we wanted to do is the science and engineering indicator book does collect information and sorts it by technology area. Now we didn't open this up to say, well, okay, come up with your technology areas. We're pretty much going to use what's already reported, and those are the ones you see here. So what we want to do is sort by agencies and by technology areas, where are those patents? So instead of just getting a number, you get an idea of the nature and the quality of these things, or the nature and the character, I should say, of these things. Are we working in telecommunications and, you know, what is DOD doing in, in medical, for example? It's something different than just thinking everything is going to a weapon system. What is NIH doing in something like computers? Again, different than just maybe what you think sort of in that box. And that's one of the great ideas behind, so where are, what information is coming out, and, but giving you a little bit more, as I said, the sort of this nature and character of what is coming out of the different agencies. Where are the investments and where are the outputs? So, you know, at the same time, as I said, we're going to talk about this huge investment in R&D. Well, we don't want that whole huge investment being characterized by how many patents did you produce, because it's probably not the best measure. A lot of things really, frankly, shouldn't be patented. So we also want to give sort of the other side of the story. Well, where do a lot of our information uh, you know, get distributed to the public and knowledge transfer really comes out of scientific articles and publications. And we have a way to look at those things. We, we, you know, they collect this information over at um, over at NSF, we want to use this, of course, in terms of our metrics to say, well, what are we producing? And again, it's the same idea. What are the areas that we're producing in there? Not just the fact that we produce lots and lots of articles, that's nice, we're glad you're busy over there, but what are the, where is the investment going and what types of areas is that federal lab working in? And again, this paints a picture of where to approach the federal laboratories. You may not have thought that they're working in the area, now you understand a little bit more about the investment. A couple things quickly in terms of even then sort of that first level outcome is things like citations. So where are they appearing in other people's works? We can look at the citations, and again, this is information that doesn't even cost us additional things. We want to just work with NSF to sort of define that. They don't actually report some of this in the way we want to report it now, but they do have data already. Software. I mentioned software back when we were talking about work products. You know, it's one of those things that would be really nice to talk, tackle right away. We didn't do it, and one of the reasons we didn't do it is because it's a bit of the Wild West. People have different ways of throwing software out there. Um, I don't, it's, it's inconsistent across agencies. For us to come up with a mandate right now would have been very, very difficult. Um, and so we didn't do it immediately, and part of the, it's, I, I couldn't tell you exactly how much software we, where we produce even for my agency. Uh, we do some things, actually, oddly enough, this is one of those that has some um, copyright authority for certain products, and we can, I can tell you very detailed information on those items. But a lot of the information goes out there. There's downloads. You know, we're not allowed to use cookies. Um, we, we don't, in certain ways, we can't track people. So we don't know where a lot of the software goes. And so some of this is actually coming up with the policy and recommendations to tackle the software issue. Probably we're not even the best people to do it, but there are agents, there are groups that are actually across the agencies looking at software and data, and we want to interface with them to actually come up with some policies that work for the agencies, rather than implementing another thing that basically we get told later on that this is extremely difficult and extremely costly, and oh, by the way, it's wrong anyways. So it's one of those areas that's going to float, and we want to learn from some of the experiences. You know, like I said, DOE, Department of Energy, is a great test bed for some of this because their laboratories actually track it probably a lot more closely than many of the other agencies do. So more to come on that one. Again, scientific and technical work products, one big area. The other one, of course, is collaborations. So we report on things like CRADAs, and we talk about non-traditional and other collaborative methods. We're still going to do all that kind of thing. We're still going to collect anecdotes. It's one of those areas that, you know, we don't have uh, tons and tons of new things, like we, we're going to report, for example, on papers and those types of things. We collect actually quite a bit already in collaborations, but we're asking for information on this stuff as well. And we're also going to break out this again, and this is something that's new and does have a cost, and uh, 
to agencies, which is, so how many of these things involve small businesses? What's the breakout of big, large versus small businesses so that we can understand how we do it in terms of this piece of the legislation that says, you know, give a preference to small business. Couldn't tell you right now. Um, some agencies can, some agencies can't, but we're going to try to get that characterized across the government. Processes. So, you know, I told you that part of the presidential memorandum was this idea of streamlining. Well, streamlining metrics are very difficult to capture, and again, it was a one-size-fits-all, doesn't really work that well. We recognize that up front. So, we took a couple different approaches here. One of them is that within the existing statute, there is a thing about licensing. Now, we haven't actually reported that, believe it or not, and it's, a, it's one of those things of collecting a lot of data. There's a lot of reasons I understand why a license, between the time it's requested, by the time you get an application, by the time you execute it, there's lots of reasons why this thing can go all over the place. The, that, that is understood, but at the same time, it is something that's in the existing statute that we don't have in the interagency report, but we're going to start including because, again, it's something that we're already required to report on. So that's one existing process metric. But the other thing we're going to actually ask every agency to do is actually give us a narrative. So what have you done? Rather than collecting a bunch of numbers, we're going to ask basically to get this idea of what steps have your, has your agency taken in order to reduce the administrative burden? What are the highlights? What have you done in terms of time and processes? What training are you doing? Basically, what are you doing differently in order to make this easier for the public to come and partner with the federal agency or, or you know, through a license to get a new product out to market? And so we're going to really do this through a narrative approach. We'll see how that goes. Um, the idea being here, of course, if we can get a lot of these narratives, we can start picking out what works. What are we seeing across agencies? What are those things then, if you, know, if you start seeing everybody reporting on the same thing, perhaps we can develop then more of these numeric metrics and focus on those areas. And so that's one of those things we're going to learn a lot through these narrative processes rather than just tell, sort of say what they are. And sort of, in some respects, that really squashes the innovation that's out there naturally in the federal labs. And I think, Paul, one of the things that has come out through a lot of the FLC talks um, is this whole notion of although narratives have always been discouraged, I'm sorry, have been encouraged, we haven't really taken full advantage of that as agencies. And that we really could beef up the narratives in our annual reports substantially. Um, now this is a general statement, you know, some agencies clearly do a great job, but in terms of the overall, that part really can use a lot of, um, you know, we can, we can all do a better job at. Oh, absolutely. And the other thing is the matter of how we use the narratives, because we don't necessarily always use them to learn. We've used them always to report. And we want to sort of change that paradigm a bit so that we're actually looking at them and looking across the narratives to see what they're telling us. Uh, I think we've kind of always sort of just read them, but it hasn't been much of a formal process. Okay, so this answers, this is so what we did. What do we do about this idea of how we doing? This whole idea of impact analysis. What's the ultimate outcome of this work? Well, we decided to take a very academic approach, if you will, to this. So rather than collecting a bunch of numbers and reporting a bunch of numbers, we wanted to basically look and see what is the literature telling us. And so instead of just collecting a bunch of as a, you know, this data flow, we're looking at literature. Um, you know, there's been some very good good studies that were done. I know we talked a bit about this Navy study, for example, that was done, and that tells you something. Well, you know, all of these things keep telling you something. So what's the story? Uh, you know, some of these things we sort of talked, I know one of the comments that came up in a session a year or so ago, maybe it was two years ago at the FLC meeting itself, was this idea of how do we tell our story? What's, you know, when you walk by a bakery, is there this aroma that entices you to come in and visit? And so... How do you make this thing attractive? How do you attract people to tech transfer? And this, this is the idea that went into this idea of impact analysis. How do we tell our story? So rather than just throwing out a bunch of numbers that we don't understand, we do know what people are telling us. And so we had the Stippy report. We had a Navy study. We had a whole bunch of studies. Agencies produce studies on the impact of their technologies. So what we're proposing to do is actually collect this information um, you know, we threw in this metric. The first one here, you see this number of studies that are done by agencies. Well, gee, that's in a way, it almost sounds silly. And frankly, we were going to throw that away. Um, but, you know, we left it in for a very specific reason, and that's actually to encourage people to do it. So if you have a number that's there, and actually, you know, and people tend to want to fill in numbers, and you don't want to get people to focus on the wrong thing by having numbers, which is 
another thing that kind of floats this whole process. But actually asking this number actually encourages people to consider what studies they've done and report that number. And then once they've considered what they've done, hopefully get the abstract or actually the study in so that we can start reviewing the success. So we've, we actually contracted out this year a, um, a review article from basically 2000 through current, through 2012, I guess. Um, what is the literature telling us about technology transfer success? And that's essentially how we're trying to address the impact right now. So we're going to do a, a uh, we'll do a write-up within an annual report on impacts as put forward in studies. Again, a very academic approach. But as th the idea here being, though, as studies are done, as we conduct a study on a particular business, we can collect that data and put that into the overall assessment of how we're performing. We can probably start to extrapolate some things like jobs and other things in terms of performance and dollars earned and all those things without setting up a huge data collection system. Uh, we've actually added some economists to the mix. I know we've added economists on my staff here over at NIST specifically in this area. Uh, but there's economists across the board, and we want to engage that community rather than just our tech transfer community. And again, I think this is one of those growing areas, actually, the, analyzing the impact of our work in terms of economic development, and not just in terms of simply numbers, but trying to show those numbers in a context and tell that story of how we're doing. And so this is actually how we answered that question. Okay, so reporting. So, okay, so we produce all this information. Now what are we going to do with it? Well, you know, one of the initial reactions is always, well, let's report on it every year. Well, let's not, you know, we did a bit of a pushback to say, well, let's not do a new report every year. We're already required to do annual reports. And so what we did, and we got everyone, everyone agreed to the idea that we won't just continually come up with a different report on how we're doing the presidential memorandum. We're actually going to integrate this with our existing requirements. So we've got an existing requirement for an annual report which is actually reflected in this OMB Circular A11. For those that don't know, that's actually the budget circular. So when an agency has to produce their uh, federal budget, one of the um, exhibits to that, uh, exhibit, to, uh, what is it, 25.5, is actually technology transfer. And so this is actually something that's, re that's required to get reported to OMB every year. And, um, you know, again, what we wanted to do is instead of doing something new on the presidential memorandum, was to actually report on how you're doing in this agency report. And not only just use it to report how you're doing, but this is where it becomes the living document. What is it that you're proposing to change? What new things are you seeing? What doesn't work so well? You know, maybe we came up with an idea that we decided to try and we need to ditch it. So we need to stop collecting data in that area. But we don't want to just set up something and say, you know, it's not like the Soviet five-year plan on how we're going to increase its progress. No, it's, it's a five-year plan, but it's a living document. Let's be smart about the way we're approaching this thing. And if we're doing something, we're seeing rapid success in the area, Let's incorporate it across the board. Let's grow this area across all agencies. Again, we also produce an interagency report, and here's the URL for that. You'll notice that it's actually fairly similar because this publication page is also where we put out the um, presidential memorandum responses. But there is an interagency report, and essentially this collects all the agency reports and then says how we're doing across the board. It's in this version, and you won't see it in the 2000, unfortunately 2010 is the current one. 2011 is in the review process, 2012 is already being produced. Um, starting in the 2012 report, actually, we're going to do, we'll produce our review article and we'll actually predict, you know, start talking about the impact analysis, but that will still continue. So all the reporting and all these metrics that I talked about actually will show up in this interagency report then. So new tables, a lot of new, fi a lot of new figures, and the way we approach the report is actually going to change. Uh, we won't lose the current stream because we didn't drop metrics, as you can see. We kept all the statutory stuff, but we've added new stuff. And most of that, again, is sort of in this nature and character. What are we really, you know, what does it mean when we say we're producing all these things? What is, you know, how, how does that define what we're working on? Um, but again, I can't emphasize enough the idea that this is not a static process. It's a, dy it's a dynamic process. It's not meant to be a one-stop, you know, one-time shot in the dark. Uh, we specifically linked it into this process, honestly, also to make it part of the statute. You know, we, it's, it's, we've got this presidential memorandum, but it survives quite a bit longer when you put it part of a, you know, when you link it to this requirement that's been around for, you know, more than a decade, you know, more than two decades, um, to do an annual report. Well, that's the end of my slides. I don't know if, um, so let me open it up. I know there's only been a couple questions, but let me open it up to more questions. Uh, there are actually many questions, and we got some really, really good questions. Um, I, I think it probably is worth mentioning that when we're talking about uh, impact studies, 
when we're talking about number of jobs created, I think the questions are not old questions. These are questions that we are, we've been asked maybe in the last five years, but I think um, there are newer questions. And as such, as some of you have remarked in your questions, some agencies don't necessarily track these things. And when you're talking about basic research, which is you know, some, some labs, for example, my agency is engaged with you know, uh, basic research, although we do have some translational research as well, but the, the focus of the agency historically has been basic research. When you're talking about a basic research technology um, or the result of a basic research, who gets credit for job creation? Is it um, the lab? Is it the company? Is it the company that hired the people? A lot of people, is it the economic uh, development office that brought the folks together to create the company? So there's a lot of folks in line kind of to take credit for that. And I don't think that's easily measurable, but it's one of the new things that we have been asked to measure. Um, so one of the questions for, that we have gotten, Paul, is what if there are no economic impact studies for a given fiscal year? Well, I think that's one of those interesting things, is I do think uh, generally there are new economic studies. If there's not, I mean, that's actually okay in some respects because it gives us a little bit of a breather to look at some of the other things. You know, again, taking sort of an academic approach to some of this thing, really you start producing then its, its own literature stream. Where we're actually looking to produce papers that talk about the economic impacts. And so if we come up with where we don't have anything new, first of all, I'd be surprised if we don't. I know my agency funds economic impact analysis. Um, so we do a number of our own and we are, like I said, we want to reach out and make sure we're looking at this community and we're inviting them into the door. Um, but if we don't, it actually just give us an opportunity to look back and how we're doing in other areas. Actually, it'll give us a little bit of a chance to do a bit of a deeper dive. I would, I would imagine that as part of the Department of Commerce, um, that probably happens at NIST probably more readily than a lot of other agencies, but, you know, maybe not. Well, you know, it's interesting. It does here, obviously, but I mean, like, for example, USDA has an economics uh, group. Um, uh, I think NIH, I believe, has a group that looks at a lot of agencies study economic impact. And kind of like you said in an introduction, that's always one of the interesting points about something like jobs. I mean, it's really hard to characterize jobs. And that's one of those reasons why we're trying to put it in a context in terms of this economic analysis study rather than just throwing numbers out there. Right. Because they're, they're very, very difficult. And that, kind of what you just went through was exactly why we didn't end up adopting those metrics. Because we didn't know how to define them. Sure. One of the other questions we have gotten is, uh, metrics for legal and contracting would be helpful. Our most significant problems have to do with cycle time. Legal and contracting cause significant delays in processing of all technology transfer mechanisms. Um, and whether you know we can we can comment on that, I think that in the past um, that that um, this discussion has been had. The question is, um, basically, one of the things that the statute had asked for is the whole idea of um, reporting the time, basically, from the time that a federal agency receives a license till it actually signs it, and to measure that. Um, and you know, it seems that there is a push to measure that more, especially in the you know in the in the presidential memo on accelerating tech transfer. So how do we deal with that? Right. Well, and again, that goes back to this whole idea of we want to try to collect the narrative. You know, one of the things we hear all the time is actually anecdotally about um, legal requirements, those types of things. You know, we can put on top of agencies a very onerous system of tracking, whereby we say, you know track all of these dates and report all of these dates. Uh, we actually do that. I mean, I know my agency, we do that. And we do report on it. And it's, uh, it's time consuming and it's not necessarily something I, uh, you know, it's easy to impose across the board on every federal agency because, again, there's large, small, there's all sorts of different people at the table. So, you know, we didn't take that approach. That's why we, again, went back to the narrative approach. So you sort of see this theme here. If it really became difficult, we ended up trying to collect more qualitative information. So one of the things we're hoping that agencies will talk about is this idea of streamlining. Um, of course, one of the interesting things is when you're, required, when you're required to write a narrative about what you've done, it makes you really sit back and think about what have you done. And one of those things is actually usually going to be streamlining the process. I'm hoping that a lot of the legal things come up there. I expect that they will. I'll be actually kind of shocked if they don't. Um, if they don't, we'll probably revisit it. 
Um, but again, we're, at this point, what we're really trying to do is see what comes out, and then we're going to start trying to look and see what's coming out as being a clearer picture of what agencies are looking at. Maybe we can report on those things that, um, then in terms of some more quantitative metrics. We're just not, we just weren't in a position to implement a quantitative metric at this point, other than the one that's required by statute. Um, thank you. To, to another question, a recent article that actually got published in the um, LES journal, I think, Lenny Bell, recently that has gotten a lot of buzz and people talking about it is an article by Cato and Stevens that um, suggests there should be a license success rate um, of 25% per patent portfolio. The question is, have any of these, um, whether agency or interagency reports, contemplated um, reporting a license success rate for the federal agencies or not? Not in terms of a specific, I mean, not, not in terms of a specific number. We don't have that. I mean, you can sort of extrapolate kind of a near-miss number. I mean, we do report already in terms of the outputs, the number of patents that we produce each year and the number of licenses. So you can come up with a rough number. Is that a real true number? That's kind of another question, though, because, you know, we all know that you could have multiple patents. You could have multiple licenses on a single patent. And so that doesn't really, it's not an accurate depiction. But we don't have right now something where we're collecting a, a percent success rate on licensable or licensed patents. Um, again, we already do a lot of that in terms of the output, so we didn't go there in terms of another number. And do you know if um, agencies readily collect that information across the board? Do they um, collect the percent licenses that, um, I mean, the percent patents that are licensed in their portfolios? Well, they would have the data. I mean, there's no doubt that they would have the data. They already have to report to us, like I said, um, the patents that they've produced and the licenses that they've produced. And so you would know the number of successful licenses. Right. I mean, I don't think that that's data. I think that data exists. But I guess what um, maybe we want to clarify is at any given year, they give us the number of licenses they did that year and the number of patents that were issued to them that year. This is not necessarily, the patents don't correspond necessarily to the licenses, correct? The, patent, the licenses could be from patents that have issued in the years prior. In oh, you mean like total active number? Exactly. Yeah, actually, um, I mean, I know, and again, this varies from agency to agency. We do report on that. Um, different, actually it kind of raises an interesting question. I'm going to kind of reach over here and grab my book. <laughs> um, but we do report on a lot of different information on, diff on the you know, um, outputs. Again, it's just sort of like how many do we produce. Um, but in terms of number active and existing, we do report on the number of um, active licenses. We, we do report on active licenses for that. Year. I mean, so we do report on number of new, and we do report on number of active. Right. So yeah, I mean, the data is there. I mean, that data I think exists. Um. So the other question, actually, now that we is um, when you say an active crater, is it, what does that mean? Does that mean a crater that's active at any, you know, for one day during that year, or does yes. That, well, so they, at all active during that one year. Right. It's a crater that was active during that fiscal year. So, I mean, you know, you, could, you can't have a crater that basically lives and dies within the same fiscal year. And you still want to make sure you capture those, because otherwise you totally miss those. So if it was active during the fiscal year, that's included in terms of an active crater. Right. Um, so I'm interested in how you would answer this question. I, I've taken a crack at answering it. but. Um, the question is, if a patent is not licensed, does it have impact? Well, I think, and that's one of those things that I think, yes, it can. And so it's an interesting question. Um, and I'll give you some of the most, probably one of the easy ways, I mean, this is in some respects a little bit easy for me to answer, is that we sometimes file defensively. Um, from my agency within NIST, you know, our work is focused on standards. Okay, well, standards are things that, you know, there's standards, ASTM, there's standards bodies that, across, that adopt these things. Well, for us, if we have an invention that is going to be the basis of a standard, we will sign over this so that it will not, basically we'll give a free license to anybody who wants to use it. Sometimes we'll patent the thing to make sure that we actually own the invention, the intellectual property, and then we will enroll that into the standard basically and say, okay, but we're giving it away. 
So no, we wouldn't have a license. In fact, anybody would have a license, but we're not going to give out a license when you know anybody can use it. Sure. Um, but we do, I mean, and I think that happens in other agencies as well. Basically, sometimes it's to the advantage, the mission advantage of the agency to own the intellectual property and never license it specifically. Or basically, and never license it, meaning that anybody can use it anyways. You could go ahead and write a paper. Obviously, you could put it out there that way. But occasionally, you really want to put down that marker that says you own an intellectual property and let there be no doubt. And I think you have touched on a great point, which is how agency missions differ and, you know, while you know, I can't say that in my agency we would um, do defensive licensing as a matter of course, I do understand and appreciate why some ag agencies might choose to do that. This brings up another good question, which is some agencies primarily have a regulatory function, and so uh, most of their credos might involve the use of their facilities, equipment, testing of a product. So there is really no IP generated. How would you measure that activity, or how would you measure the success of that agency in tech transfer? Well, see, and what you just said is actually part of the important point behind this presidential memorandum is every agency does not have the same focus. And so even regulatory agencies, interesting enough, they do generally have some inventions, but it's not their focus. So they're not going to have, you know, as many probably per capita as, as an um, agency really focused on developing new technology and getting it out there for use. Um, but again, you probably measure more of that, and that's why you have to look across the board. You have to look at the, um, the CRADAs. And it's also one of the reasons why we didn't just do a simple number. You know, this agency is doing good because they created lots more jobs. This agency is doing bad because, you know, we wanted to look at that impact analysis. So a CRADA can actually have a very large economic impact, maybe more so than a patent license type of scenario. You can have actually, you know, some things, frankly, you get so far ahead, you talked about basic research earlier. You know, a lot of the, re a lot of the things that we see even with here, I'm sure you see them over at NIH, I'm sure there's a lot of agencies that see these things. The technology is way ahead of its time. So it catches up later. Um, you know, we get these questions, again, from the Hill things about, well, tell me a success story. You know, look at something like nuclear power, yet. Um, satellite phones. There's some of these things that are huge, and they wouldn't exist except for the federal invention. And you're not going to capture that simple story uh, you know, in a one-year patent license kind of a scenario. You've got to look at the overall impact analysis. And so the different types of studies, I think that's where the academic approach tells a better story of what we're doing. And I think one of the things that, you know, we kind of go back to, and I think I appreciate more and more as I listen to you, is the importance of telling our story rather than just tabulating our numbers. Um, or the importance of maybe adding to our story by giving, adding to our numbers by giving our story you know, story because the story is really more powerful and does drive the point home much more so than, than any one number would. Well, absolutely. I mean, having the ability to say, you know, the studies from these different agencies show that, and then you present the number. Right, right. Because it, it, it seems to also, what you're suggesting is that all of these narratives will give rise to further studies and further analysis that will enable us to even speak more granularly about some of these issues that we maybe haven't spoken uh, in detail about. So to that end, do you know if any of these um, uh, plans that were submitted or the interagency plans that were submitted uh, or the individual agency plans, did any of them suggest a way to have the labs work together to, you know, to, and to answer industry needs or to answer specific technological questions? Well, one of the biggest things, like I said, comes up is this idea of complementary technologies. I think that's one of the areas where you probably see that touched on the most is sort of that, look, we realize we're working in the same areas, and so let's look at the life cycle and look at what technologies complement each other. And it's broader than just, you know, well, we all have these patents, let's all bring them to market together, but it's really where are we working in the same area and how do we sort of paint this bigger picture. Um, it's something, you know, it's, it's there. We, you know, it's, the FLC exists for that whole idea in some respects, this whole idea of network and knowing what we're doing across federal laboratories. And, you know, we talk about this uh, at the FLC meetings, we talk about interagency workgroup meetings, but we want to try to really kind of make a bit more of a systematic approach, and I think it's one of those things we keep working at. I don't know that we have a magic system. It's nice to see that we're talking about it and that the interest is there, because I think there is interest and that we'll see some progress. Um, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, as I say, if, for example, even the area of economic analysis is one of the things we've tried to do is actually form a subgroup looking at economic analysis within the interagency work group. 
And I think one of the things I would suggest that the FLC has done to kind of promote that is the new search engine that you spoke about, because by searching on that engine, um, you know, for any particular keyword, at least you see which agencies work within your space, and you can do as you please in terms of contacting them or maybe pulling them uh, together or doing patent pulls among agencies and things like that. And also, the Mid-Atlantic region has always, uh, for the past, you know, seven years, has done um, industry-focused days. So there is one day that everybody that works in bioinformatics in the region, at the labs, plus all the companies, plus the economic development folks, come together and there is um, synergy in bringing these folks that are different stakeholders working on different aspects of the same problem uh, together. So maybe those are two mechanisms that we have um, started that can give rise to more interagency collaboration and encourage these complementary technologies coming together and, and working together. Oh, yeah, I would second that. I mean, I think a lot of what was done in the FLC Mid-Atlantic region um, form the basis of much of the discussion in terms of the, um, the regional pieces of this and how we look at that. Um, and again, I mean, you know, it's interesting to see even some of the things like you mentioned the Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, it even showed up in the economic plans for the state of Maryland, the governor's plan of how they're going to approach it. They recognize that they want, they want to work through such a mechanism working with us. So it's interesting to see where that sort of ripples out to um, and you can start to see some of these impacts um, from other places. And you know, some of the impact analysis I should mention, it's not only what we produce, but also states, um, companies themselves, other people produce impact analysis looking at the literature. It doesn't only mean literature coming from federal laboratories. It can be from other sources. Sure, sure. Um, I have one question uh, on, um, that, that we got from um, startup companies. And the question is, could you elaborate on how agencies can create new startups? I thought the conflict of interest regulations prevent FTEs to start a company. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I mean, one of the other groups that actually formed out of this was actually a group that looked at ethics. Um, I don't know that we've made any great strides there, but I mean, that starting up a company from a federal lab is difficult. I mean, and I don't know that we've actually got an answer to that question. And it's a lot easier for us to get a company, someone coming in and talking to us, but uh, our researchers are notoriously not well equipped to do the startup because, again, you know, ethics rules essentially require that the day you decide that, you know, I think I'm going to start a company on this rather than doing what I'm doing now, you're actually required, you know, by law to stop working on that technology because you're now using your federal position for private gain and you can't do that. So um, that's the problem. Uh, you certainly can't keep working in the laboratory on the same technology until your company gets up and running, because again, you'd be working using your federal position to enhance your private gain. You can't do that. That's a criminal offense. So you know we've got a disconnect there on what our intent is to spin off companies versus our ability to do that. Um, I can't tell you we're talking to the ethics office, the Office of Government Ethics, on you know, well, so what do we do? We certainly don't have any answers. It's a very difficult problem. It's a lot easier for us to work with others than it is to work looking at our own researches. And this actually becomes something that comes up time and again when we talk to economic groups on the ground. They want to spin off companies and they like to get the researchers involved. That doesn't happen very readily from federal labs. And I think I have one last question, Paul. Thanks for answering um, the question about the FTEs and startups. And our last question, it seems like any specific group might find the best practice for their situation within their individual narrative metric. Are these metrics going to be, um, or are these narratives, I'm sorry, going to be available for review or summarization? Um, would, I would imagine that NIST would collect all of these narratives. Would you disseminate it the same way you disseminate the report? Or how, you know, what happens when it's submitted? I think the point of the question is uh, lessons learned. How can we best learn from each other's narrative if um, it's not necessarily shared in the community at large? Right. Well, I mean, that's sort of one of the guiding principles is this stuff isn't supposed to be done in secret. It's all supposed to be made public. And so one of the things that we're doing is taking the narratives. If you look at what we're doing in terms of the, um, the guidance is, um, that's being put out for the interagency report is to include a narrative on streamlining that we do intend to take and actually put into the interagency report. 
So I mean, right now we collect anecdotes, success story anecdotes. We also want to actually include a section for each agency on streamlining as well. Now it might not be the whole thing just because that gets too voluminous, but we do want to get that, um, the highlights of this thing and include actually an anecdotal section on streamlining efforts within each agency within the report. Well, I thank you very much. I think we have gotten um, all of the questions either um, you know, responded to in writing or um, I have asked them of you. I thank you so much for your time and expertise in this very informative session. And I'm going to turn it back to Michelle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you, Mrs. Zielinski and Ms. Bahar for your time today. And thank you to all attendees for participating. You can find the webinar recordings online at the FLC website. We hope you will join us for the next webinar in our series, Open Innovation and Technology Scouting, Tools to Implement Problem Solving in Government Entities, which will take place on, Wednesday, on May 22, 2014. Thank you, and have a good day.